Everyone's skiving off early, are they? I thought Inspector Faulkner was cracking down on overtime. Paid overtime? He's not opposed to the other sort. Did I fail to make that clear? G'day, Tom. Glenn. Nick. G'day. PJ, Wayne. Mrs P. Hello. You ready? I thought we were meeting at the pub. Mm, Mr Forbes gave me an early mark, didn't he? Pressed all the flesh he had to and let me off the leash. See you later. Let's go. Well, I think it's great. What's great? Maggie's got a boyfriend. Oh, I don't think Glenn's a boyfriend. Oh, we're going out tonight. Doesn't make him a boyfriend. Press liaison for a local MP. Police and politics don't mix, mate. Well, she uh, saw him the last weekend she was in Melbourne. And how do you know this? She told me. She even took him home. To meet him? Dad, you're kidding. What's wrong with that? Sergeant Pat Doyle, the last of the hard men. She says that he's a sweet. Yeah. Well, I've never met the bloke, but, um, legend. And she took him home to meet Pat. Must be serious. Now listen, Wayne, she told me this in confidence. And you told me? Yes, because you were denying that he's her boyfriend. He's not her boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> you could go into politics yourself. From Minister's press secretary. Some have. Please, what does she see? Power. Power, PJ, it's power. Just say there's this detective and he gets out of line with her. She sips the word to Glenn. Glenn sips the word to his boss. Oh, right, and the detective gets sent to whoop whoop. Is that it, Nick? My word, I'd be very polite. Extra careful if I were you. You two look like a stag line over dads. No, just discussing Glenn Ritchie. What's the attraction there? To you, none but to most women, thank you. To me, he looks like a journey, Chrissy. He's got no style, no class, nothing. Oh, not like a D, you mean? D's have incredible uh, style, yeah. Nick. <laughs> Don't you reckon? Incredible, as in no one believes. Oh, very good. They're talking about us. Next time we do this, how about the coach house on the highway? Good idea. In fact, we could go there for now for coffee, if you like. Or oh, we could... <clears throat> Glenn Ritchie. Yes, Ken. Oh, he would, wouldn't he? He would. I told you he had no class, mate. Chrissy, what are drinking over there? Sorry. Boss has been watching the news and there's been a big smash in Gippsland. He wants to make a statement on road safety and I've got to... Write it for him. Yeah, it's my job. <sighs> Mind if we join you? Oh, PJ, you might as well. Glenn's got to go to work. Ah, uh, Glenn, uh, last before you go? Uh, no thanks, mate. I'm on medication. Look, um, I don't know how long this is going to take, but... I've got an early start. OK. Bye. Bye. Sorry, Mags, did we, uh... PJ, next time you have a date, expect me. Good morning. You did have an early start. Now, would I lie to you? Sorry about last night. Paid off, though. Oh, gosh, it was a bad one, all right. Ex-racing car driver, Ken Forbes, MP. Drove in rallies. Won a few ten years back. Press tends to play it up a bit. You play it up, you mean? Oh, cynic. Ken and I have got to do a bit of running around the district today, but I'll be back Thursday. How about we finish our date then? Sure. I don't know. Some men have all the luck. I'll have to give him up to me now, Constable. I want him on the road. He is all yours, Mr Forbes. Oh, and uh, my regards to Nick Schultz. I saw his figures at St David's the other day, doing a fabulous job. He'll be pleased to hear you said that, sir. Bye-bye. Mm. Forbes, he's got his picture in the paper again. Has anyone seen my paper? Yeah. Forbes is in there. Don't tell me what's in it. Wish no other fully turned out. Good morning. Hey, your boyfriend got his boss in the paper again. Who said he was my boyfriend? Ross did. Thanks, Wayne. Maggie, he's stirring. That'd be right. Am I stirring? Babe? Just sensitive area, mate. Just give me the gun. Sounds ominous. Some of us have work to do.
Mr. Forbes. Do we have a problem, Constable? Yes. You were driving in a very erratic manner, sir. <laughs> Constable. Maggie. I do have to see your license. I am due down in Melbourne on important business. We have been delayed in some of our engagements today. Could we get this over with quickly, please? May I ask if you've been drinking today, sir? As you have deduced, we have just been to Horsty Brown's winery. I have tasted the wine, but I am under the limit. I'd like to test that if you don't mind, sir. What? Maggie, do we really need to do this? I'd like you to undergo a preliminary brief test, sir. I'll just get the equipment. Get on the blower to Tom Croydon. Ken, I don't... Get on the phone! Man Thomas Police. Uh, yeah, could you hold the line, please? Boss. Tom, this is getting further out of hand by the second. I think it's time for an executive decision on your part. The boss wants to talk to you. Before I speak to him, I need to know if you'll undergo the test. He wants to speak to you? Now? Yes, boss. I pulled over a car which was being driven in a dangerous manner. The driver is Mr. Forbes. I've now smelt alcohol on his breath, and I have requested he undergo a preliminary breath test. So far, he has not agreed to do so. Sergeant Croydon wants to know if he'll undergo the test, yes or no. I need to talk to him. It sounds like a no, boss. Tom! <laughs> we need to talk. All right, Doyle, if he continues to refuse the test, bring him in and do it by the book. Set up a breathalyzer and no room for error. It's a politician. Sergeant Croydon wants to know if you will take the test. Ken, you no. take Then he'd like to see you down at the station, I've sir. I've already told you. I've got several important appointments. Just lock the car and accompany me to the van, please. Sir, you have already committed several offences. Now don't make things worse. Are you threatening to arrest me? If I must. Hey. Have you forgotten who you're talking to? No, I haven't, sir. Now, if you will just accompany me to the van. Uh, hang on, hang on, Maggie. I can take our car back. Glenn, just lock the car and come to the van, please. I haven't been drinking. You can breathalyze me. I couldn't do that unless I had cause. Now, please, the van. I'd hate to see this one get out of control, Maggie. Ken's one of the best friends the police force has got. No one's done more to lower the road toll in recent years. I mean, we're talking about a role model here. An ex-racing driver preaching the good word to people. Save your breath, Glenn. We'll be talking to her boss in five minutes. Wayne, let's not blow this. No pun intended. If he's over the limit, we could end up wearing this for a long time. Tom, can I have a word? You too, Doyle. A word alone? Not till I've heard both sides, Ken. Oh. <laughs> oh, we're already taking sides, are we? Ken, I've organised for you to take a breathalyser here at the station. Please, Tom, before this goes any further, I am trying to save you a lot of strife. Ken, you of all people should know the law. Why are you refusing a test? I'm refusing a test for the obvious reason. I wasn't driving, mate. Glenn here was. Now, Constable Doyle pulled us over. Glenn and I both got out of the car. Constable Doyle just got a little confused as to who was driving. The car was in clear view from the moment it swerved around the corner onto Peterson's Road. When I reached the driver's window, Mr Forbes was behind the wheel. I'm not an idiot, mate. I'd had a few glasses of wine at Horsty Brown's winery. I realised that might have put me over the limit and I asked Glenn here to drive. End of story. They were in the car. Mr Forbes was behind the wheel. <laughs> Don't say I didn't give you a chance. Now, let's hear from the driver. Glenn, who's telling the truth here? Her? Or me. Uh, I was driving. I, um, guess Constable Doyle must be mistaken.
They're both lying, boss. I'll try and make him see sense. He's playing for time. He knows he's getting more sober by the minute. I realise that. Ken, this is mad. She makes this stick. You're out of a job. We both are. Won't get that far, mate. Tom, can we clean this up fast? I've got several meetings to attend. Well, you see, Ken, I'm in something of a cliff stick here. I accept that your constable made a genuine mistake, but now she's compounding it by lying. Exactly. Now, if you and Mr Ritchie are telling the truth, then I've got a constable on my hands who's just told me a barefaced lie about a very serious matter. <laughs> Mate, I can't throw myself on my sword, give up my licence and ruin my career just so as you can have a comfortable relationship with one of your constables. Ruin your career? I am known for my strong views on road safety. Now, if this misunderstanding becomes public property, I won't be the only one to suffer, Tom. Given there might have been other witnesses... Which there weren't. Given there might have been, then whether or not you were over the limit becomes material. Now, I'm asking you again to undergo a test. <sighs> Tom, I sit in the Cabinet Room on a daily basis with the Police Minister. I'm aware of that. Mr Forbes, now let's do the test. If I won't? Then I'll charge you for refusing a breath analysis. <laughs> you just stamped yourself a loser, mate. What type of intoxicating liquor have you consumed today? <sighs> Wine, of course. Where did you consume this liquor? Horsty Brawn's Goonawarra Winery. Are you suffering from any illness or disability such as asthma, diabetes or hepatitis? No. Are you taking any tablets, drugs, insulin or other medicines? No. Point oh nine. So you were driving the motor vehicle ESY-342 when Constable Doyle stopped you. You've just undergone a breath test on an approved device and returned a positive reading of 0.09. We have no option but to charge you. He blew 09. Get out to Horsty's wiring and see if he saw who was driving when they left. Right. Constable Doyle. A clown. We say it the same. But please, you can call me Horsty, like all the other barbarians do. <laughs> I understand you... Uh, Horsty. I understand. Horsty. I understand you had Mr Forbes and Mr Ritchie here earlier today. So it hasn't been an accident, I hope. No, no, nothing like that. Were they here long? Uh, what's this all about? Did one of them uh, lose something? They or? were here. They looked at a few bottles. They bought a couple of cases. Looked at... Yeah, taste it. Oh, you think one of them's been a naughty boy, right? Who was driving when they left? Ah, no, that's hard to say. You see, I was inside when they left. You sure about that? Cross my heart. Did you see who was driving when they arrived? Unless, again, I was inside. Well, now that the business is over, let me show you some wines. You know... It's a very important part of every beautiful young lady's upbringing that she know about wines. Hmm? I'm sorry, Horsty. Maybe some other time. That's what you did with them, wasn't it? You stood there and waved them off. You're quite right. I would have. But the phone rang. Hey. Come back when you're off duty. I'll show you some wonderful wines, huh? Horsty Brown. Old world charm. But he says he didn't see who was driving. Well, it was worth a shot. 
Now, this report you're about to write, I want it to be a model of its kind. The kind of report that in years to come, the Academy will use as an example of how a report should be written. You do believe me, don't you, boss? Yes, I do. Forbes and Ritchie were lying their heads off. I will give Ritchie this much credit. He was gagging on it. I did do the right thing, didn't I? I can't fault what you did today, Doyle. As you grow older and wiser, you might learn to pick your fights. If Forbes wasn't who he is, we could have sat them down in separate rooms and cross-checked their stories, couldn't we? Doyle, what's about to hit the fan is large enough. Let's not try and make it the size of the exhibition buildings. Right. Forbes wouldn't have worn it. You and I would have found ourselves out of a job. Not today, not tomorrow, maybe not even next week, but probably by the end of the year. Is that going to happen anyway? Not if you write the report I've just described. Roz, get me Inspector Faulkner at St David's. Thanks, Wayne. We could just make a four o'clock meeting. We won't be going to Melbourne Glen. We're going to St. David's. Now, who was flogged in my car? Uh, Wayne had to drive Mr Forbes and Mr Ritchie back to the news. That's great. Man Thomas Police? Uh, yes, could you hold the line, please? Boss, Inspector Falk is on the line again. Yeah, I'll put you through. Applying yeah, for a transfer, Mags. Good on you. Get him first, mate. It's a pretty original piece of detective humour, Maggie, which I would ignore if I were here. Yes. I said Horsty Brown wasn't much help. You could say that. What he didn't see got behind the wheel. That's what he says. Well, you reckon they got to him first? Well, that's why I brought them back in the van with me, so they couldn't phone him. Yeah, maybe just just want to get involved. Doyle. How's your report going? That's fine. Nick's taking a look at it now. Forbes called in on Inspector Faulkner at St David's. Boss, would this be happening if Forbes wasn't who he is? Well, he is who he is, and it's happening. Now, look, I'll protect you as much as I can. Do you want me to drop it? Do you want to drop it? No. Good. So, who do you know down in Melbourne? It's as bad as that. Anyone? Only Dad. Yes, I imagine your father knows where a few bodies are buried. Boss, what is it about you and Dad? He's a very efficient officer. We just have different views on policing. How often do you ring him? Every few days. It's better than I get from my girls. Anyway, the answer is no. Dad has always taught me to fight my own battles. I'm not running to Daddy at the first sign of trouble. Someone in the parlour wants a word, Maggie. Who? Glenn Ritchie. Be very careful, Dora. One of you guys come with me. I want to warn him off with a witness in tow. He lied once, he lied again. Should I ask? Love us, Tiff. You know how it is, Chrissy. Yeah, I do, Paige. Do you? I was hoping we could do this one-on-one, -on -one, Maggie. Why? So you could set me up with something else? Maggie? Only my friends call me that. I thought we were friends. After you lied? You dumped me in it? Glenn, are you seriously going to go to court and commit perjury for Forbes? How much is this job worth to you? You mustn't go to court. I don't want to see you. Talk to you, take your calls, nothing. Maggie, listen to me. Ken Forbes is one of the best friends you guys have. You proceed with these charges and he's out of cabinet. Even if he's not convicted, some of them will stick. 
Just drop it. Politicians aren't above the law. I'll see you in court. Maggie. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe when all this is over. When it snows in hell, Glenn. This is getting really serious, isn't it? Hey, yeah, it looks that way. Does Forbes really think that he's above the law? Apparently. <laughs> he sits in Parliament making laws for the rest of us. Yeah, so he does. I hope he's not going to get away with this. PJ thinks it would have been smarter to let him walk. Smarter, yeah. Would you have? Oh, probably not. Probably. Well, I certainly hope I'd do what Maggie's done. It's what we swear an oath to do. I don't know. If I was sweating on a promotion or we had a big mortgage. You're not sure? No, I'm saying I'd hope I'd do it. There's pressure on Maggie. It's only just beginning. Help you. Yeah, like a room for a couple of nights, if that's okay. Yeah, I could probably arrange that. Yeah, wouldn't mind a beer before I signed the book. I could probably arrange that too. Yeah, take one for yourself, too. Thanks. I'll be with you in a tick. Who's that? I don't know. He walked in like a cop, though. Whoever he is, it's bad news. Those two coppers talking about me in the snug. The big one's got to be Nick Schultz from Highway Patrol, right? The one who fancies himself as PJ Hashem. Who's asking? You're Chris Riley. You got my little girl staying here. You're Maggie's dad. Why didn't you say so? Nick, Peach, it's Maggie's dad. It's funny when people talk about him, he sounds bigger. Oh, the stories I've heard is quite big enough. I'll just let Maggie know you're here. Yeah. yeah. BJ Hashem, Nick Schultz, Pat Doyle. No secrets around here. Yeah. Yeah. Pulled out files when you heard Mags was going to work with us, eh? <laughs> so what brings you here, Pat? Oh, I just dropped in to see my little girl. Doing well, is she? No, she's a fine officer. Not encountering any problems. Who told you, eh? I had a phone call. Dad! <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> <Good to see laughs> you. <laughs> you guys don't mind if we just... No, uh, Use the parlour. Please. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Come on. What are you thinking of? Oh, just a minute ago. Oh. Obviously, I uh, just need to use the phone, eh? Sure, by all means. Someone rang me. Some chair polisher rang me. Wanted me to lean on you, tell you to drop it. Who? Oh, no names, no pack drill. Reasonably high up. Dad, now I don't want you buying into this. I'm not. You drove all the way up here? No. Yeah. Had a few days owing. Just thought that you might like someone to talk to. Hmm? So tell me all about it. Yeah, they're talking in the parlour. Better give us one for camera fires, Chris. I did the right thing. I did everything I was taught. And now I'm copying all this. Yeah, Glenn. He's the one you brought round to the house last month. Yeah. Daddy, he just stood there and lied. And I thought there might have been something there. How close were you? We weren't getting close. And he lied. To protect his boss? To protect his job? Both, I guess. Doesn't sound like a very nice person for my daughter to be going around with. It's just weak. Yeah, you could say that. Dad, this isn't about Glenn. No, isn't it? Isn't he the one that dropped you in it? I mean, if he'd told the truth when his boss lied, you wouldn't be in this situation. Now, Dad, you've always taught me to fight my own battles. Don't you start butting in now. No, look, I, I wouldn't dream of it, huh? Just to make sure you're OK. Hmm? Dad, I'm OK. Good. Oh, boss, you've met my dad, haven't you? Hey, Pat. Hey, Tom. Just dropped in for the one. Chris told me you were here. He's checking up on me. Perhaps you could organise us another. Sure. What the bloody hell do you think you're doing here? Just wanted to make sure my daughter was okay. 
I'll tell you straight, when I heard she was your daughter, I wasn't too keen on having her here. But she's turned up trumps. And I won't have your stone age approach to policing affecting her career. With that girl, the sky's the limit. But not with you hanging around her neck. Hurts me to hear you talk like that, Tom. Yeah? you got kids of your own. You must know how I feel. And since her mother died... I'm sorry to hear about Kathleen. She's a fine woman. Yes, she was. This winery bloke who saw him getting into the car, the one who's having trouble with his Dad, eyesight, I'm, I'm just you. saying, if someone spoke to him gently but firmly... We'll stay out of it. Of course. And keep away from my troops. Oh, there you are, darling. Here you go, boss. So. Now, Dad, <laughs> have you been eating properly? Oh, yeah, yeah. Police forces, four major food groups. Beer, pies, fish and chips and hamburgers, eh, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> You're awful. <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> Your dad was out early. Oh, that's Dad, all right. Always the first up. He's nice. Yeah. you got to watch him, though, or he gets a bit overprotective. There was a, a drug pusher once when I was in high school. He tried to date me. Probably a dare from one of his mates. Anyway, um, Dad had a little chat with him. And? And he sort of moved away. To Brisbane. <laughs> Mr. Braun? Uh, Brown. But all the barbarians call me Horsty. That's good to know, Horsty, because I'm a barbarian. <laughs> You've come to see some wines, right? Oh, indeed. Why not? And your name is? All the other barbarians call me Pat. You like to see some whites or reds, Pat? Oh, whatever makes for frank and free conversation, Horsty. Well, for serious talk, reds. Reds it is, then, Horsty. Just been on the phone to Inspector Faulkner. And? He was inquiring about where you lived. What? He pulled your file and noted that you were domiciled, his word, at the Imperial Hotel. So? I've been boarding there ever since I arrived. He wanted to know if you are paying normal rates. Boss, this is harassment. I tried to explain to him that Chris cuts her long-term guests a special rate, which he took to mean that we've got a licensee doing us a favour. Looks bad, Tom. Boss, it's pressure. Of course it's pressure. He was also asking about your brother, Michael. Is it true he's up for a promotion to sergeant? Boss, what are you saying? That, that if I don't drop the charges against Forbes, my brother doesn't get his strike? No, I'm not. Are you sure? It's the same old story. Faulkner is a mason and we're mixed. Well, those days are long gone. Oh, are they? Faulkner, Scottish name, he's got to be a mason. Don't lose it, Doyle. Now, the bottom line is you need written permission to stay in a pub. Now, we got a verbal OK when you arrive, but the paperwork has never come through from St David. Oh, surprise, surprise. It's not a conspiracy, Doyle, it's a cock-up. There it is. It's a conspiracy now. He wants you to move out. Were they his words? No. No, no, his words were, if Doyle wants to judge other people by the letter of the law, then by the letter of the law she will be judged. I want her out of that hotel today. Oh, look, I'm sorry, it's... it's petty. Take a day or so to find something. If you, if you can't find anything, we've got a spare bed at our place. Oh, and, uh... Just be careful how you break the news to your father. I don't want anything to set him off. Boss, he's not a bomb. Isn't he just? <sighs> Look at the colour in that, eh? What colour would you say that was, Pat? Blood. Arterial blood. <laughs> You're a doctor, right? What did you say your second name was, Pat? Doyle. I'm not a doctor, I'm a cop. 
I had a cop here yesterday called Doyle. But she was a young lady. That was my daughter, Horsty, and some flip of a politician's telling lies and getting rid of strife. So I want you to think very carefully and tell me who was driving that car when they left here. I told your daughter, and I'm telling you now. The phone rang, and I came in here when they left. You're making me very unhappy, Horsty. Ah, oh, threats. That's your threat. This is mine. You get physical with me, you'll be wearing this. I promise. You're telling me you can't help me. I come to this country full of barbarians because I can grow good wine here. That's number one. Number two is because you all say no one tells me what to do. I like that in a country. They usually come in threes. There's another saying that goes, let's drink some piss. Now, Pat, I like your attitude, but I honestly didn't see them get in the car. Hmm? So come on, let's drink some piss, huh? Another day, Horsty. I've got things to do. Wayne, I'm taking the rest of today off and maybe tomorrow. Faulkner said I have to move out of the pub. Oh, what? Listen, I'm sorry about the roster, but I've got to get my stuff out. No, I'm not concerned about the roster. Have you thought about picking up the phone and getting onto the police association? It's a bit premature. Listen, Maggie, we've got a spare room. Yeah, or well, we could shovel ours out for you, Meg. Thanks, guys, but... No, really, I, um, I'll make sure that Nick doesn't sleep all. It isn't Nick I'd be worried about, PJ. I'll see what I can do first. Thanks. Oh, what? Oh, it's like losing your kid sister. Chris, I'll still be around. Oh. Well, Ted Faulkner's never going to be served in here again. He can whistle for it. And the same goes for Forbes and Glenn Ritchie. Oh, look, are you going to be OK? Yeah, of course I am, Chris. Oh, can't Tom do something? What about your dad? The boss is doing what he can, and Dad's got to keep his nose right out of it. No! This was meant. Little Bird just told me you were moving out of the hotel. Celia, I only knew about it 20 minutes ago. The owners have just got off the phone. Hasn't even been advertised yet. Stunning rose-covered cottage. All right, Celia. You better show me. I'll just get changed. Tom called you. Tom? Cute, isn't it? It's a lovely garden. We'll move in today if you like. They want to leave most of the furniture here. Right. Celia, it, it's lovely. I just, um. Maggie, what's the matter? Oh, nothing, Celia. I just don't want to move out. I hadn't realised what a good friend Chris had become. You know, it's like being chucked out of home suddenly. You have to, though. Oh, yes. Celia, I have to. I'll take it. The kid was in her class at school. They're both only eight years old. Well, she's dragged him into the station under citizen's arrest. <laughs> Couldn't understand why I wouldn't lock him up. <laughs> How are you two? Hi, I've just been hearing all about you. Insisting on being Joseph in the nativity play. Uh-uh. Mm. Then it must have been the citizen's arrest when I was eight. Mm-hmm, got it in two. <laughs> Jimmy Doherty squared one of the nuns with a bubbler. You're going back to Melbourne before you start showing baby photos, I hope. I've already seen them. Oh, Dad, you <laughs> didn't. <laughs> Chris has told me about the move. I could hardly keep it a secret from Pat now, could I? I'll get the car around the front. Help you move. Thanks. Yeah, I had a chat with Horsey Braun at the winery this morning. Oh, Dad, don't do it. Well, someone had to. Yeah, and somebody did. Me. 
Yeah, well, he might have actually seen them get into the car. Let's stay out of it, please. I'm a big girl now. You're always such a fiery little number. Yep, and I still am. Hey, where do you want this lot? Just anywhere, Dad. Yeah, well, I put it in that side room. Or... Just like your mum. Tough as an old boot. Soft on the inside. Be okay. You're a sergeant. Do something. I'm doing what I can within the law. Look, they're the ones that are breaking the law, mate, not her. They have a way of get off my back and get off my bloody turf. Look, my family's my turf. Anyone touches my, my family, family. You, you interfere with this and I will arrest you. Yeah. I believe you would. Why don't you go back to Melbourne, Pat? Leave me to deal with it. I'll, uh, I'll see you settle in first and then... Okay. Why not? Thank you, Tarkasi. Let's talk about Ken Forbes and Glenn Ritchie. Didn't the boss warn you off? I don't recall any conversation along those lines, no. Oh. Well, Forbes has been good for the district. He's a good local member. Oh, yeah, that gives him the right to drive drunk, tell lies and ruin a good officer's career. She is a good officer, mate, and that's the sad thing about this. No, I don't think it's sad. Tell me what you're doing about it. I mean, the way I read it, if Forbes and Richie stick together, she's had it. Oh, she hasn't exactly had it, Pat. I would say that she has had it. She brought him round to meet me. Seemed like a bit on the weak side. He's an amiable sort of bloke, ex journal handles the press side well. Gutless wonder. Yeah, gutless wonder. Mm. If the uh, local paper happened to get hold of something that might be detrimental to his boss, do you think he might come straight up from Melbourne? Yeah. He'd hurtle up from Melbourne. I had a call from the Gazette. Someone from this office has leaked the fact that Mr Forbes is facing serious driving charges. It didn't come from here. Oh, do me a favour. Where else? Excuse me, boss. The Gazette's on the phone. I'll call them back. It didn't come from here. They said their informant was a man, probably middle-aged. Mr Ritchie, I hope you're not saying that I made that call. I'm saying whoever did is in trouble up to here. No, mate, you're the one who's in trouble. You're about to walk into a witness box and commit perjury. The case was dropped. It's not going to be. I'll be backing Doyle all the way on this and no amount of intimidation or political pressure is going to change that. Anybody here speak to the Gazette last night about Mr Forbes' little problem? No, no, boss. Where are Nick and PJ? Uh, Nick went out on the road about six. PJ's on a job. Good day, Glenn. Good day for it. spoken with the Gazette and explained that Mr Forbes would be pleading guilty to all charges and wishes to congratulate the Mount Thomas police on their efficiency. He made an error of judgment owing to overwork and stress. He expresses his contrition and he'll pay for his mistake in the same way he'd expect any other citizen to pay for theirs, believing as he does that no one is above the law. 
having had a salutary lesson himself, he'll be redoubling his efforts to lower the road tunnel. And he'll come out smelling like a rose? Probably. What brought about this sudden change of heart, Gwen? I phoned in my resignation and explained that I couldn't commit perjury for him. What brought about your sudden change of heart? Let's just say a belated attack of conscience. This conscience fellow wouldn't by any chance be named Pat Doyle, would it? If you need a statement, I'll make it now, Tom. What the hell did Pat say to you? Please, Tom, just drop it, would you? I've got nothing to say on the subject. Or ever will have. I knew Glenn wouldn't do that to you, not really. Well, I guess he was just put on the spot and showed up weak. And he thought twice about it. Yeah, that was probably a mags. I don't know what you said to Glenn, Richie. But I want you out of my town. I told you when you arrived, I don't want your style of policing here. Oh, it's gone out of fashion, even down in Melbourne, Tom. And people say I'm a dinosaur. No, oh, yes, mate, but... Never be a Tyrannosaurus Rex, will you? I don't want you giving Constable Doyle bad ideas. She's doing fine without any help from you. Come on, you two. Break up the sergeant's club. I want my dad back. I've only got him until tomorrow. <laughs> Come on. Can I have a beer for Dad?